been looking for something at my house that I've lost, and that's that's not, that's not the illustration is looking for something we've lost. That's another illustration for. I'm looking for, I'm looking for something I lost, and that's lock picks. Has anybody used lock picks before? I had a I had some lock picks that I had and I, I've been looking for them and I can't find them but anyway I got pretty good at picking locks and uh, several times I had to like my file cabinet got locked and I didn't have the key I could I'd opened it right up and and but it was locked and I've opened the, the actually front doors uh, before and you can everybody's going <gasps> you can actually do that they actually sell lock picks on Amazon and, um, and what it is, it's just, it's all for fun. Yeah. Anyway, um, and I, I'd, I'd actually used it at, at work a couple of times just because I had to. But the, I don't, you know, I don't go opening doors. Everybody's going, what does that have to do with, with the sermon? Well, after the disciples had seen Jesus crucified. After the disciples had heard from the women that there was an empty tomb, the disciples went to a room and locked the doors. Locked, the, and it says, close, some of the translations say, close the doors, but it's a, the actual Greek idea more is like they locked the doors. Uh, why would they do that? Uh, because they were afraid. And most of us lock doors because we're afraid of something. What are we? What are we generally afraid of? We're everybody's going. I'm not afraid. But actually, when when I was young and out on the ranch, we didn't lock doors. You, you know, you have the door wide open. You left your truck out there with the key in it in case somebody needed to use it and stuff like that. Can't do that. Today. Can't do that kind of stuff today. But Jesus appeared. After they locked the doors. So, the risen Jesus appears to his disciples and a doubting Thomas. This is the section that we're looking at, the last part of chapter 20. If you want to read, turn your Bibles to John chapter 20, we're going to read 19, we're going to look at 19 through 31. Now, Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene already after he had risen from the dead, after the tomb was empty. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, as we talked about last week, who was uh, not necessarily a sinner. She had seven demons cast out of her, but she was a follower of Jesus that probably uh, contributed out of her uh, finances so that the disciples could travel and minister, and along with other women who were there, at the empty tomb who saw the empty tomb. And Peter and John had run to the tomb and seen that it was empty. John believed, but we're not sure exactly what he believed because he didn't quite get the resurrection quite yet. So then Jesus appears and visits with his disciples in, in, in verses 19 through 23. He hadn't appeared yet to the disciples. They had seen a couple of them anyway, had seen the empty tomb, but they, they hadn't seen Jesus yet. Now, where is this? Uh, where, are, where are they located? Uh, we don't know. Speculation says that they were probably in the upper room right here where the Last Supper was probably. They were pro this is probably a, a residence of, of a supporter uh, that, that was fairly large because later we learned there was 120 people there that were praying and, and a lot of the followers of Jesus, not just the, the 11 at that point. Uh, and so they were probably here in the upper room. Here is where Jesus was uh, tried. Up here was the where Jesus was crucified, and right there is the tomb. Uh, now this is all traditional locations, whether or not these are true or, or the actual ones. Not sure, but they are traditional locations of these. And so they might have been in the upper room right here uh, on this side, but inside, inside the wall. This brown is the wall around Jerusalem, and the crucifixion had to take place outside of the wall, or the Jews would have uh, thrown a conniption fit. And so the, they were crucified. He was crucified outside of the wall. They were in a, a room, whatever, wherever it was. could have been another um, supporter, but they had locked the doors. And Jesus enters a locked room. Verse 19. 
So when the, it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. So what you have here is Jesus enters. They are afraid, and they're afraid. We, we never answered that question. They were afraid. We're usually afraid somebody's going to steal something. They were afraid because their leader just got killed. You know, their, their leader is now missing, and they're not sure where he's at. I'm, you're not supposed to end a sentence with that. But anyway, they're not sure where he was. And they are fearful. And Jesus enters into this locked room. It doesn't say how. We don't know how. It, it could have been he used lock picks. No, I'm just teasing. He probably didn't do that. You know, it could have been like a Star Wars thing or something like, you, you know, you just go like this and the doors open. It, it could have been he just kind of translated himself through the wall. We don't know. It's his resurrected body. It doesn't say. It just says he entered the room it, to, where the disciples were in and fearful. And what does he say, first of all? Shalom. Peace be with you. Peace. So here are the fearful disciples and and. And Peter and John, who had seen the empty tomb, and the other, other guys that were there, it doesn't say that there were other people there. It may have been, but those the, the disciples, the, the now 11 or 10, actually, at this point, were there. And Jesus enters, I'm really alive. Peace to you. Shalom. And then he showed them something. Uh, he showed them both his hands in his side. Now, why would they? Why would they show? Why would Jesus show him, them his hands and his side? It's evidence that he was crucified. Yes, it's evidence. There was holes in his hands. Now, I don't know if Jesus' resurrected body healed later. This was only uh, three days <laughs> after the crucifixion, and and when he was on the cross, his his uh, his uh, hands were pierced. And his side was pierced. And what happened? Blood and water came out, proving he was dead. And Roman soldiers, as I've said and Shane said a couple weeks ago, they know death. They know what it looks like. He died. But now he walks into the room with holes in his hands and a, and a, and some, and a, a cut in his side. I don't know if he lifted up. You know, I don't know how that happened exactly because... He, I don't know where he got his clothes, but apparently he had clothes. And here he was. The same way he appeared to Mary and the other women, who should not have been the first one if they were trying to pull a fast one. Because women weren't very good witnesses, according to that culture. Would have been men, but women were the first to witness the resurrection and the first to witness to the resurrection. And the disciples then rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So what happened? Fear turns to joy at the resurrection. Fear, they, they were scared. They were fearful. In fact, you'll see they didn't quite get over this fear because there's going to be a locked room later again. But there's a fearful, but when they saw Jesus, that fear turned to to joy because that's what should happen when we see the risen Jesus when we understand that Jesus is alive that their tomb was empty that he showed himself in this resurrected body alive and it's true just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15 if that's not true nothing matters and to them when they saw Jesus it mattered the fear was gone. It was replaced by joy that Jesus was alive. And they began to understand. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I also send you. He says, Peace again. Shalom. There's a transfer of mission. Now, I was an electrician for a long time. And in the, there's, there's, in the trades, there's something that's not, you know, doesn't, we don't quite understand it. It's kind of historic, has a historic kind of basis to it, but there's an apprenticeship program where people that are masters or journeymen apprentice people that are, are just coming up into the trade, and, and they teach them how. 
And then, then they send those apprentices who now understand out. The, the, the teachers were first. We sent disciples. Jesus sent disciples out, just like apprentices are sent out as journeymen. And so th there's this transfer of mission. God, Jesus said, God sent me, now I send you. And what's the, what's the mission? It has to do with proclaiming forgiveness, as we'll see in a minute. And they receive new life. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, now, where in the Old Testament do we see breathed? In fact, it's the same Greek word used in the Greek Old Testament, breathed. God made, exactly, God made man out of the dust of the ground and breathed the breath of life into him. And so, and of course, the disciples being good Jews, that would, that would like, wow, it's the same thing that happened back then when God created and gave life. And what's happening is Jesus is now giving life to his disciples. And it wasn't that, that they, you know, were, didn't have life before, but now it's the new life, the new covenant. And that life is given to them. <clears throat> Later on, as Paul discusses this, he says, and what, you know, why is the Holy Spirit here? I thought the Holy Spirit was later next too. Why is it here? Because the Holy Spirit is related to life and forgiveness. And you see Jesus saying, you, don't, you have the Holy Spirit, you have life. You don't have the Holy Spirit, you don't have life. And here Jesus is breathing. He promised the Holy Spirit to them. And you see the first aspect of it come as he gives life. And then there's authority also given. If you forgive the sins of many, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of many, they have been retained. Now, what does this mean? Is it, is it related to, uh, to other things? It seems like the uh, church has authority to do things in terms of discipline and, you know, whatever is loosed in heaven, earth is loosed in, hev in heaven and so forth. I, I'm not sure that the verbs are different here. They're kind of passive. And so it's like something that, that is a reality, it seems, the disciples are proclaiming in people's life. When people believe in Jesus, they're proclaiming forgiveness into their life. I'm not sure exactly how it works. But I think it's a little more than just saying, okay, this person believed in Jesus, so we're proclaiming that he has life. It's a little more than that. But we, we proclaim forgiveness. That's what 23, verse 23 is talking about. If you forgive their sins. And we proclaim Jesus and forgiveness. And then we have old doubting Thomas. Um, Thomas doubts and then believes. You know, too often Thomas is thought of as kind of the bad guy. Have you, ever, you know, Doubting Thomas, that's his name, right? But, but you see Thomas in a lot, other, a lot of various other places that is not looked at negatively at all. Here he just happens to be absent when Jesus comes and talks to the disciples. Uh, that's why I say there were 10 disciples there because Thomas wasn't there, and who else wasn't there? Judas. Okay, so there's 10 there. And, and so Jesus appeared to the ten, and he said, look at my holes in my hands, look at my side. And then he, he leaves. The fear they, is replaced by joy. He gives them the mission that they're on a different, they're on a, a mission. It's I'm giving you what I have. You go out and proclaim forgiveness. But Thomas is missing. For some reason, Thomas wasn't there. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didamus, was not with them when Jesus came. So Thomas was missing. We don't know why Thomas was missing. You know, maybe he had to go visit his mother 
I, I don't know. Maybe he was on errands to, you know, for the disciples to get them food at McDonald's or something like that. I don't know. They didn't have McDonald's back then. <clears throat> Everybody's trying to figure where's, you know, kind of what, where's Thomas. Maybe Thomas was an introvert and he didn't want to be around all the other people. I don't know. Doesn't say. It's just he was missing. So we give Tom, Thomas kind of a hard time, but he did not experience the same thing the other disciples experienced. He was, he was missing. It doesn't say he was bad for missing. It just says he was missing. He wasn't there. For some reason, he wasn't there. And then the disciples witnessed to what they saw. So Thomas comes back, in, and in verse 25, you see, So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands and the imprint of his nails, and put my finger into the place of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. So Thomas is bad. Now, again, Thomas didn't experience what the other disciples experienced where Jesus came and talked to them. So, now, what did Jesus do when he came? first came? Holes in his hands. See the hole in my side. He didn't just come and say, hey, here I am. He said, here I am, the one who died, now resurrected. And it's physical. It's not some ethereal thing. He's not a ghost. He is physical. Somebody can actually put their finger in the hole. In fact, you, you see touching. You see touching of Jesus. You know, and originally you see Mary Magdalene. Don't don't grab hold of me. It's like that's not the touching that's here. It's a different kind of touching. He's real. He's resurrected. And then. Jesus wanted proof. He's not an unfaithful dolt. He just wanted proof. So Jesus gives it, interestingly enough. So eight days later, Jesus appears for Thomas. He comes again to the disciples after eight days. In verse 26, After eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came to the doors, having having been shut, having been locked, same words, and stood in their midst and said, same thing, peace be with you. So now Thomas is there. Same kind of scenario, same kind of thing. Doors are locked. doesn't say specifically here. They were fearful, but they were locked. They were shut. They were still thinking about things. And Jesus comes, and Thomas is there. It comes again. Even though the doors are locked, again. He stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you, again. And then to Thomas, he said, Reach here with your finger and see my hands. And reach here your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believing. So here you have Jesus, who had one disciple that was unbelieving, that hadn't been there with the rest of them. He comes in, and he doesn't say, What were you doing, Thomas? How come you weren't with the rest of them? He doesn't say, Thomas, you unfaithful person, why didn't you believe? He appears to Thomas and actually gives him exactly what he asked for. Okay? Now, was Jesus there when, you know, when Thomas said these things earlier? Obviously not, or he would, have been, he would have been there. No, he knew exactly what Thomas had said and came and said exactly what he said to him. And interestingly enough, it doesn't appear that Thomas did either one of those things. What, what am I saying? It doesn't appear that Thomas put his finger in the hole, his hand in his side. He saw the risen Lord and said, my Lord and my God. And this is probably this declaration of belief and faith is probably kind of the centrality of John. My Lord, God. My God, the one I follow, the real God. He knew Jesus 
was deity, that Jesus was God, a declaration of the character of Jesus, of faith and the faith of Thomas, that Jesus was Lord and God. Now, now Jesus didn't say, no, don't say that. He let it stand. Now, if y'all said to me, you know, so, you know, he, he's that tall, handsome guy. He has that flowing gray hair and that awesome beard. Tall. Now, I would say to you, well, first of all, I used to be 6'2", but now I can barely make six feet. You didn't say anything about the bald spot on my head. And the beard, maybe that's awesome. But Jesus didn't say any of that. He let what Thomas said stand. He is Lord. He is God. And that's what John has been, been saying all this time. Who is Jesus, the great I Am? Who is Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ? Who is Jesus, the one who is going to come and die on the cross? And we remember that and remember the resurrection who is Jesus, Lord and God? That's who Jesus is. And then he says this, blessed are you. And Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are they who do not see and yet believe. Here's a slight rebuke of Thomas, not, not hugely, but a slight re rebuke. He said, you just, you just believe me because you saw me? Notice it's not you touched me, but you saw me. See is a very big deal in John. You saw me. Blessed are those who do not see physically, but do spiritually, who believe. Which is basically every one of us, right? Every one of us. And what happens is that most often, most people after the ascension, when Jesus was lifted up, this refers to. Because what happened is exactly what Jesus says. I'm giving you a mission, and you witness, and you witness about that to the next person, on down, and on down, and on down, and on down, starting there, came in, coming all the way down with witness and belief, and witness and belief, and witness and belief, all the way down to us. Because that's all of us. You're blessed if you believe, even though you don't physically see. Now, Paul was an exception. Jesus appeared to him specifically. And once in a while you see, like in, in different places where, where things, um, like the, the gospel is new sometimes, people might see Jesus. Uh, some people have seen Jesus in a dream, like Muslim people that have come to Jesus. You know, that's all uh, I, happened fine. But most people, it's like that. Blessed are you who believe, even though you don't see. All of us. And then John gives the reason why he wrote. John was written, so we would believe. He says, there's signs. In verse 30, he says, therefore, many other signs also Jesus performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in these books. There are seven recorded signs in John, and here they are. Jesus turns the water into wine. Jesus heals the nobleman's son. Jesus heals the lame man at the pool of Bethsaida. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Jesus walks in the water and stills the storms. Jesus heals the blind man from birth, and Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Now, these are all signs, seven specific signs that Jesus performed that showed who he is, that Jesus is Messiah and Jesus is divine, that Jesus is bringing salvation and he is God. Now, these were signs that Jesus uh, performed, that he was Lord, God, Messiah. Main point, you should believe in Jesus. But these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Jesus is the Christ, 
Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus, belief in Jesus, you have life in his name. From the beginning all the way down to us, our faith started way back there as the witnesses on down through time to us. So what's the application of this? Just briefly, Jesus demonstrated the reality. He is alive. He's the Son of God, divine. He is the Messiah, the one who came to save. And he desires people to be saved. He is real. It's not a figment of people's imagination, not a ghost, real, a raised human being. And we have a mission to witness. Each of us, in our situation, in our point of life, I can thank you, thank God that Jesus is alive main point of John. We're going to pray, and then we'll kind of have a few minutes, and then we'll go into a, a congregational meeting. Uh, so after I pray, uh, we'll have a few minutes to go into a congregational meeting. Those of you who want to slip out, that's fine. You want to stay, that's fine. But let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for Jesus, who is Messiah. Thank you for who you are. Father, be with us as we, um, we look around, that we open our eyes, that we see the fields that are white under harvest, that we see as individuals the mission that you have given us to witness to the risen Jesus, to witness to the forgiveness that you have for each of us based on the cross and the resurrection. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.